Welcome to the Defiant Guide to DAOs, your essential guide to, well, everything to do with DAOs. If you have questions about what they are, what you can do with them, how you get paid, get that cheddar, yo, then this will be the film for you. It's the usual thing, me sitting in front of a presentation that I have created for your pleasure to elucidate this most zesty, zesty of spaces. Alp, hit the presentation, do something great. If that's what you want to do, then DAOs could be the way to do it. We should really have changed it to DAO something great, but we didn't because we're not that cheesy. So the world of DAOs have been in the headlines a lot recently. A crypto social club that cost $8,000 to join just got a $100 million valuation from Andreessen Horowitz and other top VCs. That was friends with benefits. A new Senate report proposed the government write DAOs into Australian legislation. A DAO paid $4 million for a Wu-Tang Clan CD. What the heck is a DAO? And what are DAOs? Here's what's to know about the next big trend in crypto. Now, of course, DAOs are not the next big trend in crypto. DAOs have been around for donkey's years. Back in 2017, the likes of Aragon were forming governance procedures to govern DAOs. It's only just recently that people have fully understood that a DAO can be a really viable way of running operations. And I say operations are not a business because they're not businesses. They're a completely other thing. But the likes of who else? Mark Cuban says this, the future of corporations could be very different as DAOs take on legacy businesses. It's the ultimate combination of capitalism and progressivism. Entrepreneurs that enable DAOs can make dollar. If the community excels at governance, everyone shares in the upside. Trustless can pay. Well, it can pay indeed. And if you're looking at a $100 million valuation for friends with benefits for what is essentially a chat room, well, then yes, it can. But then excelling at governance. That is a key, key word there, excelling at governance. Most DAOs will fail. How often have we heard that? But some are already proving their worth. And we will get into all of that straight after this message from our sponsors. Don't let high gas costs keep you out of Ethereum. A balance of the gas optimized vault architecture makes trading cheaper than anywhere else. Liquidity providers can optimize their fee earnings using the dynamic fee system that automatically adjusts to market conditions. You can also use asset managers to lend out idle assets, dramatically increasing your capital efficiency. Because Balancer is an open platform for flexible, automated markets, you can choose from stable pools or weighty pools. And in the future, more designs will be created that they don't even know about yet. Check it out at balancer.fi. Avalanche is a leading third-generation layer one blockchain that has a flourishing ecosystem of more than 200 projects live, with over 100 in the pipeline as well. The latest launch of the Avalanche Rush DeFi incentive program is the largest to date of its kind, with flagship DeFi protocols like Ava, Curve, and Sushi leading the charge as they deploy on Avalanche. The Avalanche platform is fast, low cost, and super easy to use. If you're a DeFi user on Ethereum, you can quickly and easily move your assets over using the brand new Avalanche bridge and can explore the ecosystem of dApps. Head to ecosystem.avax.network to get started today. So let's just get straight into the meat of it. What is a DAO? Every film about DAOs will do this. They'll break it down. It's a decentralized autonomous organization. But what on earth does that mean? Well, let's actually do the work and break it down. The organization part, that's important. It is a vehicle for agent coordination. And I say agent and not human because DAOs could control a fleet of driverless cars, for instance. They could simply turn up, drive, go home, get paid, and deliver whoever owns the car a payment, all without anybody touching them, all done <clears throat> by smart contract. And that's the point of a DAO. It's decentralized. There's no central leadership. There is no hierarchy. It's bottom up. Everyone is equal. And they're autonomous, which means that they're governed by smart contracts. There's more to it than that, really, when we come to the autonomous part. And that's always the bit when we're talking about the DAOs that we have today, they're not fully autonomous the way that we might have, you know, driverless car fleets, for instance. They are, however, governed by smart contracts. And that's to say that the rules that govern how an organization is set up are hard coded into smart contracts, which are very, very difficult to change. And in order to change them, the whole community has to vote on them. And normally that will be that will be done with a lot of um, scrutiny and a lot of thinking about what is the best thing to do because yeah, you don't want to mess around with smart contracts and you want to make sure that when you set up a DAO, the smart contracts that you use are robust, uh, which 
you know, we had the massive hack of Cream yesterday. Again, smart contracts are vulnerable uh, from hackers who know exactly what they're doing. And if you're talking about a DAO that has an, you know, a massive treasury, that could be deeply problematic. So <clears throat> they're essentially a way for disparate entities to coordinate their activities in the service of a common goal. And that's really kind of the the academic version of it. But there is, of course, the meme version of this. In reality, hey, Cooper. Look at him, so handsome. Look at his eyes, smizing at you. Cooper, the face of DAOs. A decentralized autonomous organization is basically a chat room with a shared bank account, bro. Uh, that is the meme version of it. And memes form a big part of the community around DAOs. You know, it's informal. It's let's get shit done, but big money involved. And so big questions involved around how you set them up and how you manage the money. Uh, and that's kind of where we get to the principal agent dilemma, <laughs> getting deep here into economic theory. The principal agent dilemma is a conflict in priorities between a personal group and the representative author authorized to act on their behalf. So you are the principal, you work in a company, you have a CEO, the agent is your boss. But it could also be you're a shareholder of a company and the CEO is the agent. Now, you are invested in that company and you have a vested interest in seeing that company do well and you vote on things and the CEO is then meant to act on those. But it's quite possible that the CEO might act in their own interest and they might act in a way that is contrary to the best interests of you or anybody else. Same thing could happen if you were looking for legal representation. Um, your lawyer might not act in your best interest. They should but they might not. Uh, same thing if you're an actor. You have an agent um, and a manager, and the manager might decide that there's a really juicy project that they could be the producer of, and they'll act in their best interest instead of yours when they're supposed to be representing you, and you can kind of see where this goes. This is about us delegating authority for certain things that we do to other parties and then being disappointed and exploited in the actions that they take because we foot the bill, basically. Um, so, you know, you can imagine um, a trader acting or taking big risks and knowing that the the major company they work for will bail them out if it all goes wrong. That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. And, and similarly, you put your money in the bank. You don't know where the bank invests that money. Um, they may not do things that you want them to do. That's the principal agent dilemma. DAOs solve that. They completely decentralize everything and they remove that hierarchy and turn it into... Um, something completely different. So here are some of the characteristics of a DAO. On the left here, you'll see some well-known DAOs, Pleaser, Maker, Climber, Metacartel, Moloch. Um, and these are essentially founded on a shared goal. So you will find DAOs coalesce around something. So for instance, Pleaser DAO it was just a group of NFT enthusiasts who saw an opportunity to to really take ownership of the most significant pieces of art that were being produced in the NFT crypto community. And so they did. And as it, as it turned out, that was a massively successful mission statement. And it gave them a chance to create headline grabbing um, moments in the NFT space and, and good for them. It's, um, it's all really sort of built around uh, People Pleaser, who's an artist, female artist, Brilliant story. So they're founded on a shared goal. They will have a multi-sig wallet. So they have a treasury and that treasury has to be governed. And But you can't have all that money in the hands of one person. So they have multi-sig wallets normally built on Gnosis, but there are a few other options as well. So they have that built-in treasury. They have bottom-up governance. They are trustless. So the organization of a DAO is trustless. You, can, you don't need to trust the other people within it. Usually you have membership via tokens or NFTs and, you know, there are various um, arguments pro or, or con this model mainly to do with centralization so that um, the weight of tokens that you have and the disproportionate amount that say a founder might have um, in the running and governance of a project it's the same issues that we have throughout crypto you know the rich getting richer the one percent core members having a disproportionate amount of weight that's yeah. If you're doing most of the work, then you probably should have most of the tokens. DAO rules are hard coded into smart contracts, as we already know, and transparent. So because it's smart contracts, you can audit the code, you can see exactly how the DAO is set up and what rules it's built on. So you can decide for yourself whether that DAO suits your sensibilities, whether it's something you want to be part of. 
They're highly participatory. Participatory. It's a good word, isn't it? They're designed to allow you to participate and they encourage you to participate. But I think a lot of people probably squat in DAOs and wait for them to do something cool that they can benefit from. And they're kind of freeloading, but that's just par for the course, really. Um, the more you participate, the more you are rewarded. And DAOs can set themselves up to incentivize people who are more involved. And we'll look at some of that later. If you want to put something forward, decisions are made via proposal. So you propose something to a DAO and there'll be a vote on it. I mean, any stakeholder can propose an idea. That's the whole point. Um, so that ideas can come from anywhere. There's a great story about great TV showrunners with the writer's room. They will often invite the coffee boy to come and just pitch an idea in the room. And most of the time that's shouted down, but they occasionally come up with something cool and that's inclusive and it allows ideas to be heard from anywhere. So if you want to submit a proposal, you can submit a proposal. Doesn't mean it will be accepted, but then everyone will vote on it. And the whole point about DAOs is that incentives are aligned. So you, as a member of a DAO, have kind of gone a certain way already in terms of aligning yourself with the mission of that DAO. And so it wouldn't be in your own interest to act against it because you're a stakeholder. And you might be a minor stakeholder and it might get political and you might want to prove a point, but inherently it's designed to align members' incentives around a common idea. And if you've gotten as far as buying the tokens, then presumably you jam with that. And if you don't, well, you can leave. And finally, they can't be shut down. So the code is set, it's there. And once it's up and running, well, it just does its thing. Now it can be changed, of course, but um, it can't be shut down. Not unless you actually want to, which which can happen because some DAOs just die. Um, they just run out of juice and that's okay. Um, so there are two main types of DAO. You have ones which um, are built to create decentralized governance around protocols. So make a DAO, Pi DAO. Um, so these are for open source blockchain projects that need um, to really be decentralized. And then you have investments. And there are other types, but it's not really worth going into them here. Um, so you have investment in people, in services, assets, and protocols. So in people, it might be an investment in, um, you know, uh, somebody like, for instance, Rafik Anadol, um, that you want to just basically support that artist through their career. Or please Adao, you know, uh, with people pleaser. Uh, there might be services that you need, like legal services, um, assets, NFTs, for instance. Um, or you might decide that you as a DAO have a particular interest in metaverse protocols. So anything that's connected to the metaverse, you'll build a metaverse DAO, and that'll be your guiding principle for how you invest. And then people join and add their own investment, could be ETH, could be something else, that they then plug into the pool and become stakeholders in that investment vehicle. Important thing to not be tripped up by is the DAO which was um, back in 2016, it was a project that raised $150 million. And if you think that $150 million is quite a lot of money, which it is, and even for the ICO phase, that was an enormous amount of money, absolutely enormous amount of money. I think Tezos was one of the biggest ICOs, somewhere around 120, 130, something like that. But that's not the most staggering number here. The most staggering number is the ETH. 11 and a half million ETH. Just think how, how much that would be worth today. 11 and a half million ETH. That is a staggering amount of ETH in today's money. So this was a venture capital fund for decentralized projects. Token holders could vote on projects to, to receive capital. And they would then be paid out if uh, the projects were profitable in rewards. Who knows what those were going to be. But um, if you look at it from through today's glasses, obviously a security. And the SEC, in fact, came out in 2017 and said, yes, this was a security. And uh, even if the hack that we're about to talk about hadn't happened, they would have been in deep doo-doo, I am sure. But what did happen was um, there was a smart contract that wasn't properly audited and some hackers just drained the entire contract, um, which then ended up with them owning an enormous number of Ethereum tokens. And that sprang up an ideological debate, which was this. This is There are so many tokens in the hands of people that shouldn't have those tokens. The Ethereum community 
were kind of caught. Do do they continue with the chain as it is, or do they do something unthinkable? And it actually turned out they did something unthinkable. They actually rolled the chain back to before the hack happened and restored the ETH to the original owners. That is, even now, thinking about it, that is so extraordinary a thing to do. And it still rankles with the Ethereum community. It's the reason Ethereum Classic was born, because Ethereum Classic is the unaltered true history of Ethereum. But the Ethereum that we think of as Ethereum now is the one where it was rolled back to before the hack and then continued. And if you think that the whole point of a blockchain is that it is censorship resistant, it cannot be tampered with in any way. Here is an instance where even if it was for the greater good, they actually did do that and set in the process a precedent. They set a precedent. And who knows when that will come back and bite them in the ass. But it is one of those things that it cuts right to the soul of what a blockchain should be. And you know when Solana was switched off recently during uh, the disruption there, same idea. Like, If there is a kill switch on a network, then it's not decentralized. It's just the way it is. So anyway, that was the DAO. But that was then. This is now. So now we're talking about participation. How do you participate in a DAO? Because as we said before, it's participatory. And you need to be adding juice to the system for it to function. That's the point. We It is crowdsourcing talent to get something done. So there's different ways you do this. But as we said before, incentives are aligned. So a DAO should be set up to align incentives. Um, most DAOs are now. It's quite rare to find one that is not set up the right way. And then you get into things like um, the tools. So we have verification using Collabland. NFT communities are pretty much au fait with Collabland now. But before the PFP thing, I think most people probably didn't even know what that was. Um, but it's just a system for you to verify your wallet and it allows token gated access to all sorts of different things. Then you're going to stake in the DAO using your tokens. So you have a certain number of tokens and often, for instance, FWB runs seasons and every season the cost of a membership goes up. So anyone who was in early, it's a cheap entry point for them and as it progresses, it gets more and more difficult to get in. Um, and again, with FWB, you have to be vetted and allowed in on merit uh, for Friends of Benefits. Uh, they're trying to create, I guess, a curated list of contributors and participants um, which, yeah, it's a form of centralization, but I mean, it's their community. They can do what they want. Then you get to vote on proposals using Snapshot, and we will look at Snapshot in a second. Um, you'll get rewarded usually in tokens if you participate, if you add value, if you uh, do a task for the network, um, sorry, network for the DAO. If you perform a task, it could be you know creating a piece of content, doing a website, adding some code. Uh, and the more value you create, the more value you earn. I mean, it really is that. It's a, it's a meritocracy, which is one of the kind of core tenets of blockchain is, um, you know, nobody cares who you are. They just care what you do. So this is Friends with Benefits. Uh, it's a wild website, this one. Um, very kind of chaotic and weird, but this will give you an idea of um, what Friends with Benefits is all about. No, it won't. You actually have to be in the Discord to get a sense of what Friends with Benefits is all about. This will teach you absolutely nothing, and it'll just look weird. Where crypto meets culture. Um, so we're looking at snapshot now. Um, this is snapshot, and here you will see proposals from lots of different projects. There's tons of them on here. But you can see kind of Gitcoin, Sushi, Uniswap, yeah, um, Bankless DAO. Let's have a look at Bankless. Um, we can have a look at the proposal. So Bankless currently have a proposal to create liquidity using Olympus Pro. And here you can see 76% um, are in favor and 23% are against. Uh, we've covered Olympus Pro previously, but this is um, for them to bootstrap their bank token and remove liquidity from liquidity mining. And this is all part of the DeFi 2.0 movement. That's very nice. I hope they get that through. Uh, we could also look at Olympus DAO themselves. Um, lots of different uh, proposals here. But as you can see, the proposal itself is pretty short. Uh, and all you have to do to cast your vote is um, have the appropriate token in your wallet, and then you can add your voice to the debate, which is great. And that is how Snapshot works.
Very, very simple. So let's get back to the presentation. So order in chaos. The thing to remember about a DAO is it's not a company. A company will give you a contract and say your working hours are from 9.30 till 5.30, and you have to work this many hours a week, and we will give you this much holiday time. DAOs aren't like that. They are, I think what they do well is they recognize the fact that people in crypto are able to give a, an indeterminate amount of time, an indeterminate number of days a week, and they will contribute as and when they can, however they can. And that is very difficult to base kind of project management on. You want people to say, I'm good, I'm here, I'm do this, I do this, I do this. But that's not how DAOs work. DAOs are about creating opportunities for people to give more of themselves if it's right for them. And so a good mix of a DAO community will have a lot of different people who at a certain point will kind of spin up and get faster and give more of themselves and they might recede into the background. It's a lot like, I mean, from my world, making a film, you know, it, you have this massive surge of energy where you get all these different talents and people together and you all work really hard and you'll become best mates. And then the film finishes and then everyone disperses and then it's done. It's that similar kind of energy. It's just gathering talent, bringing it together for a specific task and then allowing it to disperse. Now, during, you know, in, in a complex multi-layered DAO, there will, could be all sorts of different things from running events to writing a piece of software. But fundamentally, for the DAO, respecting and facilitating this is key. I've linked here to an article um, that was on Forefront from Jack Fancy at Protein. Wrote a really nice piece on, well, how to DAO. And it gives you some really good ideas is about um, just how to step into a, a DAO and, and start understanding how the DAO is and then start having you know conversations and, and create value for yourself. Definitely worth having a look at that. I've linked it down here below. We'll put the presentation in the description and allow you to view that at your own leisure. So now we go to the important bit, earning from DAOs. Because in many ways, this is kind of a reflection of the gig economy or the task-based economy that has sprung up over the last kind of decade or so and has been exacerbated by COVID. People need to find work, need to find ways of subsisting. And in DAOs, there's always a work to be done and not enough people to do it. That's really the truth of it. And I, I like to think of DAOs as talent nexus points. Um, we used to see this in Telegram communities. You would see people spring up who had talents in you know, meme creation and other things. And it was very difficult for them to get heard or to realize any of that talent in any meaningful way. DAOs supercharge all of that and allow that energy and that willingness to participate and get involved a path to earning. And so there is lots of different ways that you could earn within a DAO. You could be a developer and create code. Community moderation is a massive one. Just dealing with communities, um, making sure that information is announced properly, and also that spammers and you know um, hackers and people who are trying to disrupt things are dealt with properly. You can create content. This is probably where I would fit in. You know, writing medium articles, graphics, videos, all this kind of thing. Creating content is actually extremely difficult, um, and it's incredibly necessary. And I tell you why it's so difficult is because I think a lot of people can create one good piece of content, but most people can't create another one and then another one and then another one and then another one every day, every week, every month. That's hard um, because keeping the energy to keep telling the message, very, very difficult. Uh, graphics. We all need graphics. Uh, you've noticed that with desktop publishing and with media articles and with YouTube, everything just looks good. So... There's a heavy weight on graphics, particularly in this space where there's nothing physical to touch. Everything has to be explained. Everything has to be clear. Graphics are incredibly important. Websites, obviously, um, you tend to see it with PFP projects. They have very minimal websites. It's not as important as it used to be, but still definitely a place where you can pitch in. Administration, just managing documents, managing keys, managing the flow of information from one place to another. That's a huge piece of this puzzle. Treasury manager, well, that speaks for itself. And then there's specialized DAO roles that are specific to the DAO that you're in. So for instance, um, with Pleaser DAO, 
somebody will be responsible for taking submissions for you know something that the DAO might be interested in picking up. So when they bought the Wu Tang album, um, and I won't go into the story of that because it's a really nice video about how they did it. Someone had to broker that deal, and there has to be someone who receives that deal and deals with it. But then, you know, if you're a legal DAO and you're specifically dealing in legal questions, then you need legal counsel and you know people who know what they're doing. Uh, and it could be technical, you know, having someone that really understands how to um, architect a specific piece of the code. So how do you get paid? Well, a reward can mean a variety of different things. A cabin, they say um, we pay for eligible work. And when we mention pay, we mean rewards in the form of liquid ownership. Liquid ownership, that's a really kind of interesting term here. So liquid, they mean be useful for rent and food. It's a recognition that nobody works for free. We actually have external costs and overheads that we need to deal with. And actually, you know, if you want people to work hard, great, but they also need to feed themselves. And we can't all just be expected to just work, 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 work in what is effectively a 24-7 economy. I saw Cooper lamenting the fact that his work life seems to completely destroy his social life. Um, you got to achieve some kind of balance. And then there's the ownership part, distribute governance power of the community. In the article, Cabin say that they, they're very concerned about the gig economy, which allowed people to be entrepreneurs and to, to earn you know, doing something like you know, driving an Uber, but they had no exactly zero ownership of the community that they were in. They were generating, they were the actual, the most important part of the puzzle, but they, they, they got nothing back from that. They just got paid the fee. And so that's what this is attempting to address. There's, you get paid, but there's also ownership. So you normally get paid in a DAO native token like FWB, um, but there's also USDC and there's more and more traditional looking salary type arrangements coming on, uh, it's particularly when it comes to software developers, um, because you want the best coders in the space and they're not cheap. So kind of more traditional benefits packages and this kind of thing are being set up. It's rare at the moment, but I suspect it will become less rare the more mature this space becomes. And so you could be a full-time hire in that respect and have, I guess, whatever contract you decide you want to put together. And I believe Aragon has contracts or sample contracts that you can um, take, but I don't quote me on that. Um, there are grants, so you could apply for a grant to do a specific um, task that's that's uh, on a list of uh, things that the, a protocol might or a DAO might need. There are bounties, so you know, go and find um, bugs in the code. And then there are gigs, so there's particular task-based things like we need a website, we need a video. Um, then there's source cred, which will reward you based on your participation. So it'll track how many messages, uh, how much you participate within you know the day-to-day -day dialogue within a DAO, and it will track that and then give you cred, which will then be rewarded however the DAO itself sees fit. And then there's this incredible thing called Coordinate, which was set up by the team at Yearn because they realized that they needed a way to pay people properly. It's wild. Um, I'm going to allow my co-host here, Alp, to speak at this point because Alp has been contributing to a DAO called Created DAO and making videos for them. And I'm just curious kind of what that experience was like for you, Alp, as you were... Um, working in that in that space yeah so uh i work at a, a dao called creator dao and um this dao is a group of content creators that came together and uh, created this dao earlier this year in summer of 2021 and um <clears throat> so basically if you do any sort of content creation that could be graphic design video editing memes translations anything that uh, any anything that relates to content, basically, you can join. And as any other DAO journey begins, this begins with a Discord server as well. So uh, I joined over just about a month ago, and I hopped in the server and joined the welcome channel, introduced myself. The onboarding ex experience has been uh, very smooth. So what what kind of how does it work exactly? Do you get a there's a is there a brief put out that says this project needs a piece of content made and then do you pitch for it? How, how does it work exactly? So it works like this way: um, you join the Discord server, you introduce yourself, 
as I said. And then once they see that you're a legit content creator, they give you a, a, a tag and that opens up the rest of the Discord servers to Discord channels. And every project, every client has its own um, Discord channel. And basically what you do is you get in touch with the project manager for each client and you basically jam about uh, what sort of content you can create for that particular um, project for that client. And so far I've participated in like three to four uh, projects. I've uh, created videos, some graphic design. And um, as a result of that, at the end of every month, you um, there there's this thing called the Epoch. So, uh, and it's done through the Coordinate application, actually. And what happens is there is um, you get invited to a Coordinate um, session through your Ethereum address, and you get rewarded a number of gives, as they call it. And based on how much um, c content, how much effort they've put into the um, into the in, into creating content, you give gives to each member of that um, project, and through that they distribute the the rewards. And and, and what are and what are the rewards? Are the the rewards the create created DAO's own token, presumably? Um, well, it it depends on it depends on the project. So some projects give um, their own tokens. Or sometimes they give stable coins. I participated in one epoch. I got um, USDC in return of my um, the content I created. But um, Creator DAO is also creating a native token, the Creator token. They're not sure what that's going to be like, what the utility is going to be for that at the moment. But um, so it really depends. Well, that sounds pretty positive. Well, let's let's actually take a look at Coordinate because that is um, one of these mechanisms for allowing people to do this. This was actually built by the Yearn team. So they, they, they needed a way to do decentralized payroll management. And um, so they said, on this new frontier, we face new kinds of coordination problems. We need to compensate and recognize each other for the effort and passion we pour into DAOs. Coordinate was a tool to do just that. We go beyond just paying people. We made the experience of working with DAOs more rewarding, human, and fair. So there's a set of tools for DAOs called Coordinate, built for Yearn. And this is kind of how, how it works. You have a dashboard where you, you basically reward your young contributors um, and you say who you worked with and what happened, and it creates this map that allows you to visualize those interactions. And the, the further the closer you are into the center of that map, the, obviously the more busy you were and you can imagine the likes of Bantech um, being quite heavily rewarded for that. The Epoch is a month, I believe, at Yearn. So every month this is uh, reviewed and then everyone can kind of just say, well, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. And then they get paid for it. And the wife, they get paid in Wi-Fi tokens and um, and something else as well. But uh, this is the Bankless DAO version of that. So you can see from season one of them using Coordinate to season two, just how how centralized season one was and how quite a, just a few people were doing most of the work. And then in season two, everything's just spread out and there's just so many more connections between so many more people. It gives you a real sense of how a DAO can scale and how it can grow, but also the, how this simple tool can allow you to um, reward people properly just based on the connections that they assess between themselves. So Coordinate is a really interesting um it's a really interesting uh, tool for everyone. Um, this is the website. I've stuck it in the uh, the link in the uh, description below in the presentation, so you can have a look at that. Let's get back to this. So, how do you find your feet in a DAO? Well, the first thing to do is say GM and vibe with that Discord channel because every Discord channel has its own sort of weird personality and. Uh, its own vibe to it. And it takes a bit of time to orientate yourself there. So the best thing to do is just listen and listen to how people speak, listen to the tone of the conversations that they have in a software DAO. They might be more serious and more tech focused than in a PFP DAO. They might be more meme and culture based, but you know, that's, that's about you listening and then conversing with people. And you also have to respect the culture, you know, don't just go in and start, you know, talking about how this token is going to go to the moon because you'll get shouted down very quickly because 
there'll be a lot of people who've been there a very long time and feel that they are they should be respected for that. And there is, that culture grows up organically. Next thing you should do is suggest. Suggest ideas. Suggest things and see how they land in a DAO. Um, because if you don't speak up, how can you possibly know? Uh, don't overcommit. So don't give too much of yourself too soon because you might end up being disappointed. It's better to ease yourself in. And don't be discouraged if your first proposal is rejected. You can't win every time. And then the other thing is be prepared to walk away if it's not for you. There is no hard feelings here. Sometimes it's actually, you know, we want to put a bunch of energy into something and then our circumstances change and you can walk away if, if it's just not working for you. Um, or you just might not get on with the people that are in the down. It's also totally fine. There are tons of DAOs out there and there probably is one for you. So, you know, don't feel like the tokens you've bought or the time you've invested is, is wasted because it's absolutely not. So how do you create a DAO? Because maybe you don't find a DAO that you want, or maybe you just feel that this particular brand of toothpaste is one that you want to arrange a DAO around just to, you know, make sure it's governed properly. So how would you do it? Well, you create a token using a mirror crowdfund, says Cooper. You store funds in a Gnosis safe multi-sig, says Cooper. Then you set up a snapshot space for governance, says Cooper. And then you make a Discord with token-gated access, says Cooper. All of which is free to use, minus gas, says Cooper. We should listen to Cooper. Cooper is wise. Cooper's face is everywhere around DAOs. It's almost impossible to get away from him. We actually had him lined up and uh, we couldn't make it happen. But we will soon because he has a lot of good things to say. And if you want to hear some of those things, you can check out his podcast with Jason Choi on Block Crunch. Um, so much good stuff there. And Cooper has done more than anybody else to participate in DAOs and figure this stuff out. Uh, another shout out I want to give is to Aragon. Um, they have a huge amount of interesting information, tools, resources for you to understand how to put a DAO together. It is so much easier now to do this than it was even just a year ago. So people can get on with the, the process of clustering ideas and energy and talent and money around the idea rather than figuring out the infrastructure to make stuff happen. We can have a quick look at Aragon now. Uh, this is their manifesto. They say, we're committed to building organizational forms that defend self-sovereignty. We want to create collaborative mechanisms in which violence is not only disincentivized, but impossible. <clears throat> and we want to create long-term value versus short-term profit. So all of this stuff is really, really, really kind of top-level visionary stuff. But at the end of the day, as Cooper said, it's a chat room with a wallet. And really, it's about ownership. You know, It's having ownership in something, having a stake in something in ways that weren't possible before. And I don't think any of us really quite understand or know how big DAOs could be or will be. Cooper seems to think that LLCs, limited liability companies, will all be DAOs in the next three years. I think that's ambitious and that's optimistic. But certainly, from an organizational perspective, it makes a lot more sense to do a DAO than other things. But it's still there's still a bit of friction. But this is the DAO landscape at the moment. You can see, oh, look, it's curated by Cooper Trooper. Who's that? I told you, he's everywhere. So you have DAO operating systems, you have protocols, services, social DAOs, media DAOs, collected DAOs, grant DAOs, investment DAOs. Uh, there are going to be lobbying DAOs to lobbying governments about um, crypto regulations. That's for certain. And there'll be legal DAOs as well, um, because you know when you're thinking about challenges to protocols, what's been interesting is that governments you would have thought had all the power, but as we're starting to see um, crypto protocols and the crypto community are pretty switched on when it comes to this stuff and have very loud voices and they will lawyer up and fight back because they will. And it's going to get very, very interesting because not only will they do that, but they also they got a lot of money. So we will see a lot of legal DAOs, I'm sure. Very specific blockchain-focused legal information. So talking about legals, uh, what is the legal status of a DAO? Well, I can't give you the exact um, status of that because I don't know and it's not really my expertise. But I do know there have been some interesting developments on that front. Wyoming, who else, um, passed a law uh, that allows um, DAO LLCs to register in the state of Wyoming. It's a, You actually have to be in the state of Wyoming. And there are other things like the legal name for the DAO must include the word DAO or LAO. Um, it also has to be um, 
The DAO smart contracts also prevail in any conflict with the DAO's articles of organization. And it, yeah, there's a, there's a few different things here, but essentially Wyoming, which is um, sort of one of those um, states that's taken on the mantle of being crypto friendly, kind of like Delaware for um, other trad finance, it's trying to be a place where um, crypto can be uh, have a friendly home, but I mean, it's fairly restrictive. And then um, A16Z also published a paper called A Legal Framework for Decentralized Autonomous Organizations, specifically trying to look at how you would tax DAOs. Because if you get paid by a DAO, then that should really be income and should be taxed. And DAOs themselves can earn income and they could be securities. There's so many gray areas here that will need to be ironed out. And as fun as it is to kind of spin up a DAO and have a bunch of people kind of aping into stuff or you know, changing the world together. There are concerns around the legalities of it. So at this time, two things are certain. Direct payments from DAOs for goods or services are taxable as are capital gains and losses from the sale of governance tokens. Um, so we shall see what happens with that one. Uh, but that is definitely on the horizon. And uh, who, yeah, this is Miles Jennings. This is the tweet thread that kind of posted this. This is very recent actually. Um, so this is something else that I've linked in the presentation. You can have a look through Miles, who authored that that piece, um, just to see what they were thinking. And here's Caitlin Long from Wyoming talking about this um, official announcement of a new type of LLC, which involves DAOs in Wyoming. Will other states follow? We shall have to see whether they actually do. Now, I haven't really gone into... DAOs, the famous DAOs like Please or FWB in too much detail because I think you should find that out for yourself. There are so many of them out there, like Pi DAO, like um, Moloch DAO, that it's it's really the work you have to do for yourself. And it's you know it's pretty easy to get into a Discord channel and just find out, or you can ask people. Uh, the thing I know about DAOs is that they they really 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 do need talent more than anything else. They need the juice to make the engine run. And that juice does run out, and a lot of them will die, and it will be a slow death. Gradually, people will just lose interest and lose enthusiasm, and that's going to be horrible. Uh, but it will happen, and talent will move on. But if you are looking to incentivize people to come and work for you, then um, really look for the best talent you can find, and then make it really easy for them to onboard, like Alp was saying in, in Crater Down. So that's it for this long-winded and strange guide to DAOs. I hope it was useful for you. If you have a question, ping me on Twitter. I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. And we're also looking, you know, of course, at the Defiant about whether we should follow in Bankless' footsteps and set up a DAO. Not sure about that yet. Not sure about whether we actually need a token. That's up for debate. But it's really amazing to see just that coordinate map of participation in the DAO. So if there's a model for us to follow, maybe it's there, maybe it's not, we should have to see, but uh, definitely on the radar. And I think in terms of creativity and building new models for creating content, now there is something I think we can really put together, a really fascinating DAO, and maybe we will. Stay tuned. Thanks to Alp, as always. I will see you after the weekend. Have a great one. Peace.